This is a Colored Pencil Podcast, session number 295. Welcome to Sharpened Artist, a Colored Pencil Podcast. Weekly discussions in and around this medium that we love so much. Hey there, my name is John Middick. Welcome back to the show. This is the Sharpened Artist Colored Pencil Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for hanging out week to week. It means a lot to me. And I'm excited to welcome back to the show, Barb Sodiropoulos. Barb, how are you today? I'm doing great, John. How are you? Awesome. All right. So I've got some exciting news regarding uh, our sponsor for the podcast, UART Pastel Paper. And if you've never tried UART, uh, you want to stick around and listen to what I'm going to tell you about near the middle of the show. I'm going to talk to you about how to get some UART paper for free. Do you use UART sanded paper? I have not tried it yet. I bought a sheet of it, and I okay. still haven't gotten around to doing it. So ah, I, okay. I feel like we talk about this often, <laughs> and I'm always like, "Yeah, yeah." And then I just I, I figured no, I never by, get to by it. now you probably would have uh, tried it out. You know what? Part of it is is that I keep trying. I want to buy the 800 grit. And yeah. I haven't been able to find it here. So, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, one of the art stores that I, that normally carries like all the things that, right. like, are like usually things you can only get in the States. Yeah. They have a 600, mm. but I, I just keep like, I don't know. I, I'm worried about getting one that's like too coarse and then being unhappy with it. Like I want to try to have like yeah. the pinnacle experience with it, I yeah. guess. So I'm sort of. Well, six, uh, 600 is very, very close to 800. But yeah, 800 okay. is just my favorite. So stick around, guys, for the middle of the show. And I'll talk to you about how to get uh, a sample pack for free. So give UART premium sanded pastel paper a try and experience the UART difference. So today we're going to be talking about how to make up your own mind, how to create your own opinion about materials and products. Right, Barb? Uh, but I think it even goes beyond that, uh, even to uh, technique. You know, there's a lot of things that we come to uh, the medium of colored pencil with. There are opinions, there are biases that we have in anything, right? But when it comes to an art medium, um, you know, what did you do before you started doing colored pencil? What other art experiences did you have? Well, for a lot of us, if we've uh, never done art before and we're just starting out and we don't have a big fancy degree like Barb does, I always like to pick on that. <laughs> then we come to this maybe kind of like we feel maybe like it's a blank slate. And so we need input. We need experts around us. We need to ask questions. And I think sometimes that that whole uh, thought process of I need others to tell me what to think can be a detriment to our growth. And so I think that's really where we're headed with this discussion today. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, as a disclaimer, everything we are saying is our opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, something that we you hear a lot, especially these days, is that uh, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. And I think <laughs> right. uh, I think when it comes to art supplies and that sort of thing, um, you know, that, that can be definitely be true as well. There's a yeah. lot of people, I mean, even myself, I do blog reviews on products and I'm always giving my opinion, but I think you have to keep in mind that, you know, certain things, for example, like, you know, factual things like light fastness and archival quality, those things yeah. are things that are tested, you know, scientifically or in a lab or that sort of right. thing. And so, you know, if someone is going to make claims like that, the, it, it needs to be based on fact. It needs to be yeah. based on a test that was done that, you know, takes factors into control, like, um, you know, having a control, making sure there's no outside factors that are influencing that, you yeah. know, for people, for example, who want to do their own light pass testing. It's great if you want to do that. But at the same time, you know, your, your, your results are, are potentially going to be skewed if you have factors in there that are affecting it in, in a way that could skew your results, I guess. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Um, and it's not to say that you shouldn't do that or try to do that, but right. just as an example. Um, but I think, uh, 
th- that's something to really keep in keep in mind is that if mm-hmm. you're if you're not getting that in, those kind those types of information from an actual credible verified source right <laughs> right yeah exactly uh, you know, th- those are the kind of things you really need to to just keep in mind. Yeah. Now, companies pay, um, you know, an R&D team, usually under the umbrella of that company itself, or they outsource it. You know, they pay them a lot of money for testing. Uh, every company does this. Their uh, Their job is to verify results. So they're, you know, they're making um, assumptions about things. They test it. Uh, it goes through a process of research and development, and if it's not done in-house, then it's outsourced, and it's done by third-party companies. Seems to be a little more repu- reputable when they do that, right? Makes sense. Uh, so they have a third party to be able to review things, and then they get those results back. They iterate and improve, and we're talking about products. So light, fast testing would be very similar to that. Also, archival uh, materials is very similar to that as well. So me as who am I? I mean, I, you know, they're not going to, I'm, I'm a pawn, you know, whatever. I, I am a consumer, you know, I, I am not part of the R and D team. And I, you know, I, I can't even pretend to be that. And I could have some opinions on what's light fast and what's archival, but it really does need to be based on facts. Now I might be able to do some, low-level testing myself, and it's really anecdotal then if I do something over here on my back porch and then I say, oh, this is gospel truth. Uh, This is exactly what happened here, and then I don't ever refer back to the research I did. And this research, you know, the body of this, the corpus of this research is my back porch. (laughs) You know, it's kind of laughable. The reason why I'm making a bit, and I'm sorry if we, we're sounding very vague about what we're talking about, but um, in some ways, maybe I'm not sorry about that. I mean, we need to be a little bit, but I'm just I'm illustrating a point that uh, be careful who you listen to, how you listen and what you're actually taking in. And, you know, there's there's a difference in the sources of where you get your information. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the thing too to remember is that everyone, whoever's doing a review, they're they're not always necessarily an expert. It's just an, it's yeah. an opinion, right? So, right. Uh, you know, even, even for me, like I, when I do blog reviews on products, I will take stuff directly from the company's website in terms of features or things that's actually printed right on the packaging and, and that sort of thing, just as a, like, you know, to, to use as a summary of, of part of the review, but, yeah. um, you know, even with companies, you know, you were saying that they are, uh, they hire companies to do specific testing and that sort of thing. Right. And the, the kind of second part to that is when a company is making certain claims about things, they, they also have a bit of an obligation to not lie about that. That said, they can get in trouble this. for doing that. Yeah. And, and that said, we've totally, yeah. and we've talked about this before on, on another show, but, uh, the other thing of it is, is that you also have to be careful about what language they're using because sometimes yeah. they're they're not lying, but they're using certain marketing language to right. position themselves in a way like light fastness is a huge thing with yeah. color pencil, for example. Like they'll say um, great light fast ratings. Well, great light fast ratings might only apply to half the pencils, but because it's still they're they're not saying all the pencils. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great point. They can also use that term. Uh, great permanence or something. There's some yeah. other euphemistic kind of term that they'll use. And that's marketing language. I'm sorry. That is totally. marketing language. And we have to be able to navigate these tricky waters and to be able to tell, is this a slippery little slope that they're trying to pull me down? Or are they being upfront about exactly what this product is uh, on the blue wool scale or the ASTM? Yeah. Yeah. And and to be clear, like we're not necessarily suggesting that companies are lying. It's just that when it comes down to marketing, you know, most, most people who are selling colored pencil at this point are, are making comments that that are, uh, are in their, their favor, I guess, in turn from a marketing perspective, they want to be wrong with that. Yeah. And I I mean, they do products all the time, right? Like it, it, 
Right. There's always it's always it's just like it's it's like bending the truth sort of. So yeah, I don't think it's ever done maliciously. No. It's just no. that it's it's one of those things that you you just have to be mindful of. Like for example, again with Light Fast, if if they don't actually specifically either on their website or in the packaging give you specific Light Fast results on something. Yeah. So if they're using that language, if they can't actually prove what their light fast ratings are, yeah. then right. chances are they're they're making a bit of a sweeping claim, in yeah. my opinion. So and saying I, good light fast um, without yeah. using a standard to substantiate what they're talking about, then that is yeah. an opinion, and they're entitled yeah. to say good light fast because yeah. that's an opinion on the yeah. amount of light fast being. Wherever it is, they yeah. can call that good because they're the product makers. And so whatever end result that they're after, then to them, they could qualify and saying that is good light fast for that market. That That is totally within their uh, right to be able to even argue, I think, probably legally. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to give legal advice and none of this should be considered legal advice, but <laughs> it's my opinion. But what I'm saying is if they if they were ever um, you know brought to task on language like that and saying good light fast, I think they could stand on both legs and say that is our opinion that it's good light fast. We didn't say that was a standard that we applied to one of these core, you know, two core standards that are uh, industry recognized. Totally. And yeah. and I think that's that's kind of the the point to keep into consideration, right, is that you know, there's there. It's it's as far as I'm concerned, light fast is kind of one of those buzzwords in in colored pencil right yeah. now. It's it's the equivalent yeah. of people putting organic on things, right? And food right, products, right. like it's that sort of. Well, they want to have the word organic on their on their food because they know that right. people want to buy organic, and it's the same to me. It's the same yeah. thing with colored pencil. It's like oh, it says light fast Absolutely. just because they know that that's such a a top of mind um, quality that people are looking for in their um products that it's it's like okay well we may we may have our, our product might only have light fast ratings in only in the good range or like just above the like the acceptable range but mm -hmm. that is still i mean in in some legal way i imagine they are still able to make that claim because yeah. of that so oh i'm um, sure that their legal department went over that with a fine tooth comb and yeah. gave them the thumbs up i mean i i don't think they would just make a risky move and use language like that that isn't thoroughly thought out and tested. Yeah. yeah. And again, I think our, our point is just that, you know, when you're when you're researching products or when you're going to purchase something, it, the point is just that if you're seeing those claims, make sure, you know, if you're if you're purchasing, purchasing the product with the intent of using it for artwork, you're planning mm -hmm. to sell originals of, right. then you just need to make sure that you, they, you can back up whatever their claim is. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, I think a lot of people know with the, with the brands with, you know, great light, black, light, fast, sorry, ratings tend to be in. So that's pretty common, but you know, there's always newer brands coming out or something like that. I mean, we, we did a whole series of show on, Mm -hmm. on newer brands of colored pencils that were affordable right. or whatever. And, right. and, and people want to know like, okay, well, is, is this acceptable? Do I have to spend hundreds of dollars to buy polychromos or Karen Dosh or something like that to, to get this to the same results? If, if another company is, is selling something for substantially less that has the quality. So, yeah. um, and again, that's just all part of the process that you as a consumer need to be, sort of informed and not always necessarily um, rely on the opinion of of the company itself necessarily, unless they are actually backing up their claim somehow, or even for that matter, you know, a, a good example of that is for the longest time, people used to say hairspray was an acceptable fixative yeah. for charcoal and pastel. And right. I'm sure there are still people that, that swear by it, but I am telling you like what a product that is made for your hair is not archival quality for art. No. Like it's, it's just not right. So, but I grew up with art teachers saying yeah. to me and for years I was like, Oh, hairspray, I can just use <laughs> hairspray until I actually did the research myself one day and i was like oh no you this is not good in here <laughs> yeah but but the problem is is that so someone 
And this is kind of another point in this topic is that somebody who I felt had authority and who should have known better, I guess, or who I was looking to as a position of authority told me that this was acceptable. And so because in my in my naiveness as a young art student, I believed them and I was I was like, okay, cool. This is an acceptable thing to use. And at the time, I knew nothing about archival or you know, acid free anything like that meant nothing to me. I had no I mean, I was a teenager, I had no context of why that was important or what that meant. So, um, you know, there's, I think you always just have to take certain things with a grain of salt when you're when you're getting opinions from somebody who is, who is not, um, I I, want to say not a professional, but in this case, Mm -hmm. this person was a teacher. So it well, they could even be (laughs) a professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And still disseminate bad information totally um, from a good place. I mean, they they probably, uh, you know, and that's kind of the way that works is there's enough people saying the wrong things and you start to believe it because, hey, (laughs) I'm not going to disagree with the masses. One million people can't be wrong. You know, I mean, it's like if there's enough people saying something that is incorrect, uh, there's a tendency to believe it anyway. And if the right person and right is in quotes here is saying the wrong thing, (laughs) then there's a lot of people that can be duped by that. And so that's the word of warning, I think. And one of the takeaways today that I really want to leave you with is that, you know, uh, don't don't believe something just because someone has, you know, the loudest horn and they're able to speak about that thing loud and wide and far. And that sound travels uh, so quickly. Uh, Take it and uh, sit with it for a while and test it and use your own reasoning skills and mix that with some research on your own and uh, don't just take someone else's word for it. Yeah. I think the thing I want to add to that as well is that uh, sometimes user experience is actually user error. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, Yeah, exactly. I I notice a lot of times again in, in the Facebook groups, I'm always in there watching. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, There's a lot of times where people will talk about a certain product and they'll just be like, Oh, I hate this, or I can't get this to work. And a lot of times they're, they're reaching out to the group to sort of get to pull the opinion of the group. Like, well, what's your experience been? Like, what am I doing wrong? And, and you'll get a mix of opinions. And a lot of times there'll be people that will be like, I hate this product. And, and, and what's unfortunate to me is a lot of the time I see people hating something and it really seems like they hate it because someone else hates it, not necessarily because they've tried it themselves. Um, yeah, right. I mean, I, I think um, I and it's kind of, it's kind of time. That's well, and it, totally. And I think yeah. what ends up happening is there's a bit of confirmation bias too. Yeah, right? exactly. So, So what happens is like, you know, someone you look up to and respect says, I hate this type of paper. And then you try this, the same type of paper for whatever reason, or maybe you have tried it and it didn't work for you. And you're like, yeah, I hate that paper too. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, the the thing of it is. It's easy to rant with fellows, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like you're, you're, you're going to be more willing to accept the opinion of, of, of something that you're already sort of biased towards. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and it's, it's funny because a lot of times I'll see this, you know, and it, and it always happens with the, like, what's the best paper, what's the best pencil (laughs) debate. Right. Right. And, and to me, the short answer to that is that there isn't one that is the best for everyone. There's just not like people ask this question all the time. And, you know, when I started with colored pencil, what I did and what worked for me, was I would find an artist that I really looked up to or I liked their work. Yeah. I would see what materials they used. And then I would try that combination of materials and see if it worked for me. And in some yeah. cases it did. And in some cases I moved on from it. For example, I used to use uh, Strathmore Bristol Smooth and then Prismacolor. That was the combination that I used in the beginning for everything. And as my tastes changed and as like the the... I guess, techniques and that sort of thing that I I started using or or leaning more towards, I switched that up completely. And I still sometimes flip between different papers or different 
pencils. And, and for me, it's more about, I know, and I've done sort of the research and experimentation to find out that, okay, if I'm trying to do a certain type of effect, or if I'm planning to mm -hmm. use mixed media, my combination of paper and pencils is going to be completely different than if I'm doing something that I want to look really highly, um, like maybe it's a shinier surface. I might, you know, and, yeah. and that doesn't work for everybody. I, right. I'm comfortable flipping between things or uh, combinations, but certainly in uh, the beginning, that doesn't work for, for most people. Yeah. They, they need a formula in the beginning. Yeah. And, yeah, and a lot of people that, are right. seeking that. But what I'm saying, I guess, is that I think in doing that, you have to keep an open mind that like, for example, if, if you find, if you find out what uh, combination of products Heather yep. Rooney uses and you get those combination of products and then you don't understand why your work doesn't look like Heather Rooney's well right. guess what <laughs> there's there's more to it than that first yeah, of all absolutely and and, and blaming she, the wrong thing is often what we see in those Facebook groups totally so and the thing is I mean she's developed techniques and you know how her brain works how her application works that combination works for her but yeah uh it's not necessarily going to work for you like i see all the time people being like i actually really hate polychromos which i mean unpopular opinion clearly but yeah. no but i mean <laughs> but but truly like it doesn't make their opinion less valid because they feel that way for them they truly that product just doesn't work for them the, the way they want to render the way they want to do things and and i think if if we were to all sit there and listen to one person's opinion on that and say like, oh, well, this person said this product's terrible. I'm not going to use it. Well, well, don't rule that out because actually maybe that might be the one for you. Right. That right. might be the one that actually works best for you. I mean, again, unpopular opinion. When I, I was so excited about getting a set of Karen Dosh luminance for the first time. And when I used them I, for the first time, I was like, ooh, <laughs> not because it was bad, just because it was very different feeling. Yeah from what I was used to. And so for me to now use that product, I'm going to have to sort of, um, you know, alter the way that I render or the technique that I'm using to use it in a way that's going to be successful for me. Yeah. So, yeah, I had this yeah. uh, experience, you know, there's all kinds of reasons, I suppose, for, you know, false cause whenever we're evaluating something or, you know, another way that that's often said is correlation does not equal causation, right? But what, what that gets at is that if you're looking at a product or something that you're trying and your results are not what you saw some other artist achieve, then the problem sometimes isn't with even the technique um, or the products. Sometimes it's with the building of the skill. Like there, there's a, there's a built up knowledge that happens and it's cultivated over time. And that doesn't mean that the technique that you were using was poor or was not good or anything like that. It, it probably, it could probably mean, and I think most often it does when we're new is that you've not developed that technique uh, to a point where you're able to execute on it. So even, and, so I know I know it's splitting hairs a little bit, but stick with me. Even if you do something, even as as prescriptive and formulaic as somebody lays out, and you don't get the result that they've gotten, that doesn't mean that their technique was bad. Is what I'm getting at. By that same token, it doesn't mean that the products were bad either, or that you know the paper or the pencils you know were bad. The tendency, I think, Barb, is that we do want a false cause we do want to blame something and it's easier in our minds sometimes to blame something outside of ourselves and to not look inward and say oh it might mean i need more practice in this area or i didn't know the little nuance of changing some little thing and that eluded me she did something a little bit different than what i must have done but we don't have enough experience to even know what that thing is. But it's okay at the beginning, is what I would argue for. It's okay at the beginning to sit with those two ideas. And this is really where I want to take the discussion and leave you with this whole idea that sit with the idea that you're not going to be perfect for a while. Um, you know, I, I don't 
I don't feel like I'll ever achieve perfection, but I'm always striving to be better and better. I'm never going to be at a level that I love at the beginning. And for a while, I need to sit with the fact that my artwork just doesn't look very good. And um, I, I'm, I need to be okay with that. I need to look at it and say, okay, this part about it, I do like this part over here. I'm not real crazy about. And if you can do that and keep iterating and improving every time you get to the drawing table and you execute, then that gap is going to be, um, you know, that chasm there is going to be uh, smaller and smaller every single time. So be okay with, you know, not, not doing things perfectly and improving and growing. And if somebody has a strong opinion one way or the other, and you try that thing <laughs> that they had a strong opinion either uh, for or against, and uh, it doesn't just correlate with reality after you've mixed your own experience with it, then be okay with that. And you don't have to rail on the thing that happened. And you don't have to use this false cause and blame something else. Look inward. That's what I'm uh, encouraging you to do is to look inward and just to say, okay, something happened there. I'm going to, you know, modify my, my technique next time. I'm going to modify some little thing that I wasn't aware of next time and just go with that. So, yeah, I, I, think like I just ranted for an hour. Yeah, you really did a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm just, I'm going to let you finish. But <laughs> no, no I, I think, uh, I think what you're saying is, is, is all really valid. I mean, I think it's okay to, to change your opinions on things yeah. too. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, again, it's, it's not going to be common that you stick with the same thing the entire time that right. you create. And, and that's okay. Like you might decide to, like I said, have a different combination of things, or you might change up your style slightly and that might require using different products for that. And I think what ends up happening is you just see certain people tend to become these town criers yeah. against right. certain products because they've had such a negative experience. But I mean, I'm kind of, okay, that said, I think that we should also hold companies accountability to make good products. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm not, I'm absolutely. not saying that, you know, we shouldn't call them out if something's terrible for but sure. Barb, isn't However, it true though that you can see one artist achieve amazing results on let's take paper on a, a certain paper support you know a surface yeah. and you take another artist who otherwise can do very wonderful awesome creations of artwork put them on that surface and it's just you know a, a want wah experience and it they just can't can't do it they cannot do that I think that's the point, though. So like, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, here's the thing. If there was really only one, if there was one pencil to rule them all <laughs> or 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 like yeah. one paper that sure. was like the best, yeah. like yeah. It, it would be overwhelmingly the case. Like you yeah. would you it would put everyone else out of business. If right, it was right. if it was as simple as there being one answer to that question and we wouldn't need thousands of products either yeah, thousands and, of and, papers, and we do have it, thousands of papers i think it's 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 like it's like the coke pepsi debate right like <laughs> some people like coke yeah. some people like pepsi they're very similar in my opinion as someone who does not drink pop or yeah I guess me either they taste like soda, soda in the united now. states i don't know what happened but <laughs> so, anyway. whatever <laughs> my point my point is is that like it's it's yeah. I mean, some people like apples, some people like oranges. Are they, is one fruit better than the other? Should we get rid of one fruit because more people like apples? Yes. I don't know. Yes, like it, should. it's, yeah. <laughs> I think, to, <laughs> I think to, to, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Apple supremacist yeah, over right. here. Right. Um, no, I, I think. <laughs> I don't hate them. Just, oh but yeah, that's it. That's gonna have somebody logic. from like the, the, the fruit society coming at you now, being like, "Listen, that is I don't appreciate some of the arguments." So, for, no, but truly, like, for I, our gain, uh, some of these products. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just think, like, in my opinion, there is room for everyone. Yeah. Yes, there will be there will be things that are better than others, and sometimes certain, like, like for example, uh, 
you know, Fabriano Artistico, uh, the hot press yeah. watercolor paper. Right. It's supposed to be watercolor paper. A lot of people use yeah. it for colored pencil. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, sometimes just because a paper is labeled for, I right. mean, you art standard paper is technically for pastel, is it right. not? Right. So, it, it, and a it, lot of people use it for colored pencil. It's not necessarily, it originally probably was example. never marketed for that. That's a great example too, because I hated it when I first used it. Hated yeah. it. Um, I didn't go around talking about it like, oh, I hate that paper, but I did hate it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Good thing because they're a sponsor now. <laughs> that would have been awkward. <laughs> but I did hate it when I first used it. And uh, it's because I didn't really use it much. And uh, there were some other things about it that, um, you know, I, I watched a small tutorial on it. And it was one of those flowers, laces, and bases kind of thing. So it was like, here, do this and then do that and use this color and do that. On a printed sheet, you know, someone used their printer actually. And that was the, you know, the tutorial. But anyway, that aside, it was just like, I, I didn't like the experience because I wasn't used to it. And I, the, the techniques that I had developed using paper uh, didn't work the same way on that paper. So it put me out of, outside of my comfort zone. And uh, I sort of just kind of crumbled under that and just like, oh, this isn't, this isn't working. It must be the paper, you know, there again, I'm blaming, you know, something else is what was going on. Well, and I didn't and really I think, do that a lot. I really did realize that it was me not being able to execute on that paper because I wasn't used to it. Yeah. I think the important thing there too is also that it may not, you may not be successful on something the first time you use it. Right. So paper and pencil combination or each individually like you may you may not get the results you think you're going to get the first time around and yeah. so you know the advice that i like to give people a lot of the time is for example um color pencil magazine has a uh, a paper sample pack that they yeah. sell i think it's like 9.99 us or something uh -huh. and it's it's like i think they're around uh maybe four by six or five by seven or something like that sheets uh -huh. of paper and it's 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 a sample pack of you know i think some of the maybe five or however many of the popular brands that color pencil artists tend to use yeah so for example um you know buying in most art stores you can't get sample sizes that small but just as an example if you're if you're able to you know go and buy sample sizes or smaller sheets of paper of different papers like try it out and yeah. and what i like to do and what i used to do in the beginning was i would draw the same thing on different sheets of paper mm -hmm. and and you know use either like the same pencils or whatever i had available just to give myself that comparison because i think what happens when you do those kind of experimentations yourself yeah. is you'll know when something feels right to yeah. you when you're when you're rendering with it yeah. and i mean i use the example also of the illustrations that i did for the the stedler packaging oh yeah people probably would never believe me but i used the strathmore colored pencil paper for that I and a lot of people really have bad opinions about that paper but honestly when i i did preliminary tests on like my favorite papers and that was the one that those colored pencils yeah. looked the best on and you know the whole point was that i needed to create a drawing that and and maybe that sounds unbelievable but i'm telling you it's true <laughs> and 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 what's funny about it is that like you know it, it you know most people would be like well i can't believe that 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 worked for you but it, yeah. but it did right and right. and i it was actually the last paper that i tried but for whatever reason i just wasn't getting i wasn't getting the saturation i wanted i wasn't it was yeah. I, and and the whole point is that you want to find something that's going to make uh, the colored pencil look the best yeah. or for what, for right. the, the, the techniques that you're using. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it again, it may seem unbelievable, but, <laughs> but for me that the, the combination of that pencil and that paper seemed to work. And, oh, right. and, yeah. you know, I think just doing some self-experimentation yeah. is, 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 
priceless yeah. when it oh, comes yeah. to figuring things out yourself and and forming your own opinions and and be confident in that like it, just because somebody who is high profile hates something or whatever right. like yes i understand because i have people that i look up to as well and i i look to them to see what their opinions on things right. are and and one of the things that i try to always in, that's part of the disclaimer in my blog reviews is that i always encourage people to try the product from themselves uh -huh. Um, you know, I, I very rarely ever give anything a bad review. I try to like, you know, show both positive and negative points of it, but I, I very rarely have come across something I've absolutely hated. Yeah. But, uh, at the same time, like if I do hate something like that's just, that's my opinion, but it doesn't right. mean that like you should now boycott them <laughs> for, for life. Like, you know, at, while I, while I want people to value my opinion, I need people to know that it still is just my opinion yeah. and, yeah. and you know, what I think about something and what you think about something could be completely different. And both are, both our opinions are valid. Yeah. They're both. And, valid. and it's, it's, it's due to experience, especially when it comes opinion. to products. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just kidding. Okay. So and I love, <laughs> I love that. You really slipped that in there at the end. There. And Barb's trying to have a serious <laughs> moment. And you're making jokes. <laughs> Barb does do an incredible job though. Uh, truly she does on, on her blog. I, I appreciate your blog so much. Uh, but I, I love what you said, though, about, you know, testing this for yourself. And it's easy enough to do with a sample pack of papers. Uh, same thing with pencils, buy a smaller set and test those pencils to see whether or not you agree with some of the opinions that you've had out there or a mentor that you've been uh, perhaps following because you can grow and you should grow past your mentors at some point. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that though, Barb, and I want to take a second to pay the bills here. Um, UART is the sponsor of the podcast right now, and I'm so excited about this, guys. You can go over to the show notes, sharpenedartist.com slash podcast, and there will be a link set up for you there where you can get started testing and sampling the UART paper and to see if it's something you want to explore further. So you can fill out the form and get a free sample of UART paper over there. So that I think is a great benefit to just grab that and test it in your own studio with your own pencils, form your own opinion, make up your own mind and see if it's going to be a paper or a support that you want to explore further. So. Go over to the show notes and check it out. And we thank you, Art, for their support of the Colored Pencil podcast. Okay, where are we here? What about? I just want to revisit again the yeah. fact that you hated that paper when you yeah. first tried it. Hates maybe a strong word, but no, you disliked the, the right paper. <laughs> and and no, but truly, like what right what a, what a great example <laughs> of giving something a chance. Honestly, yeah. like yeah. I know that sounds maybe a little biased because they're a sponsor of the podcast, but for real. Like, yeah, think of, think about that. It's like it something be, that you, uh, you maybe could have written off yeah. is now something that you swear by and ironically now sponsors I mean, your that, podcast. That was, like, I don't know if you, yeah, I don't know if you guys saw the, the last piece that I did um, called Lexi, but it was done on the UART 800 grade level of uh, sanded paper. And I, you know, the thing that goes on in my mind, though, is I'm just like, why did I wait so long? Because I truly love sanded paper now. And I waited years because I was just like, I could not work on that paper. I didn't give it a chance. And I waited so long to try it again after that experience. Same thing kind of happened with um, uh, pastel mat paper. I was, you know, I wasn't a real big fan when I first tried it. And I learned my lesson, though, from that experience with sanded paper. And I kept trying it. I kept using it. And I started loving it. And now it's one of my favorites, actually. But, yeah. Yeah. I just, you develop and grow, right? You 
you totally. Start I just clicking. think that's such a great example, though, of why yeah. you should give something a chance sometimes. Yeah. Like, I mean, that said, there's a point at which you, you need to let go. <laughs> you don't yeah. want to you you force it if it's really not happening for you. But I just <laughs> I just think it, it also just reinforces what we were saying about yep. sometimes it being a bit of a user error situation is that Absolutely. sometimes sometimes it could just be that you're not you're not using the product or the paper in the optimal way, or there's a technique that you need to learn or practice to be able to successfully, you know, and and that said, not every paper and not every pencil is going to um, be that difficult to, to kind of get a result from, but there's so many factors involved in, in the result that you're getting to, to just blame it on the product itself is, is not necessarily always fair. I think. No, right. It's not at all. Um, and I, I do want to mention this because I think it also illustrates the point that we've sort of indirectly hit on, and that is that please look at the motivation of the person who is railing against products, okay, uh, or is fighting for a product, is uh, rooting for a product, or has a sponsorship. Um, you know, I you could question my motivation for trying to promote UART. I don't think you can question it too much right here with uh, getting a free pro- I mean, you've got a free product. So, I mean, try it out. There's, there's nothing I'm gaining from you trying that free product. You know, um, you're going to be the benefactor there. But look at motivations that people have when they make claims. And sometimes you can't ferret out what those are. But I guarantee you there are motivations. Sometimes somebody uh, is uh, promoted in a book. Or sometimes they're being sponsored or given, you know, some type of inducement, if not money directly or products to um, and, you know, let me play devil's advocate with that a little bit on the side of the creator. And they'll say, oh, no, but these are all my own opinions. Yes and no. Um, That company approached you. Yes, I I agree with that. You're already using the product. Okay, I agree with that, too. But now that you are sponsored by them or you are receiving some type of favor uh, to keep reviewing the product or keep talking about the product, there's something else that happens and switches in your mind to act and behave in a favorable way towards the company or product. And you can you can even um, you know be self-deluded and think that you're not being influenced by that, but you are. Um, I mean, any logical, reasonable person thinking through that would understand that, yeah, you're, you know, you and I both, uh, anybody, we're being influenced by products and companies that may be giving us money or some other, um, you know, favor uh, in exchange for our opinion. Yes, it may be our own opinion. Yes, they may not have told us what to say. But there's sort of an implied relationship there. And if we don't understand, if we are that self-deluded that we don't understand that, uh, that I don't even know what to say to a person that wouldn't understand that uh, type of reasoning. So I think you, what you also have to hope is that, you know, Instagram, for example, is full of people who are social media influencers, which is yeah. apparently a job title now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, they, they make a lot of money yeah. from companies who send them products and right. they, you know, either the product needs to be placed somewhere, or they're there to give it a favorable yeah. review or, you know, and, and sometimes that, you know, the company will even say, like, be honest about it, but you're right in, in saying that there is going to be a little bit of a bias. I mean, if, if, Faber Castell decided to give me a bunch of stuff for free. I'm I will certainly not be upset. And However, some kind of droid who has no opinion. <laughs> I mean, you they're but, asking for your opinion, but at the same time, we are people. We are sure. influenced by relationships for sure. But I think just in considering the source too, you have yeah. to think. Okay, like, do I have a? You know, I'll use a social media influencer as an example. It's like, okay, do I have a history? with this person do they typically recommend products that i agree are also good because i have also tried them and agree that i like them and and again you know to some extent that's coming down to opinion it's like does my opinion align with this person's opinion and is that why i tend to agree with them or you know there there's plenty of times that i've 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 had you know whether it's other artists or whatever say 
I don't like something and I'll be like, actually, I really do like that or mm -hmm. whatever. And, and I go on my merry way and I live my life <laughs> and it's yeah. fine, you yeah. know, but it's, uh, you, yeah, I mean, it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning, just about considering the source and whether you think that person right. is promoting things um, that they do truly enjoy, even if they are being paid or if they are, yeah. you know, like it, it is hard to some extent to believe, um, I guess a, a little bit of the honesty of, of a review of somebody who has been very, very like being paid to promote yeah, yeah. something because well, I believe that you know, most but, of the time they think they're being honest. I mean, I, I do believe that. I, yeah, I, don't think I mean, there's going to be a bias setting sure. out to deceive people. Large. Yeah, I would hope not. But, but what I'm saying is like, I think what it comes down to is that you still have to um, be willing to make your own opinion. And, and if you end up disagreeing with that person, that also doesn't mean that you, that now discredits them either. Yeah. It's just yeah. that, you know, the thing about opinions is that they're all different <laughs> Yeah. or sometimes you agree and sometimes you don't, but, exactly. um, you know, I think all you can do as an artist specifically, when you're trying to kind of form your own opinions and find things that work for you is there is going to be trial and error. And, um, I don't know that there's really a way around that. Um, no. I know people want, uh, one answer. Art supplies can be very expensive. I, I can completely yeah. understand that people don't want to sink a bunch of money into things, but right. you know, I would say that also goes back to what you were saying earlier about purchasing smaller sets of things. Yeah. Um, you know, almost every single company sells a set of 12. Right. Right. Any, any of the ones worth their salt anyways. Do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a set of 12 is, is such an excellent way of trying out a good sampling of a medium in, in right. various colors and getting a sense of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, when I first tried a uh, Faber Castell, um, Albrecht Durer watercolor pencils, yeah, right. I only ever had the set of 12 for years. And then I eventually bought a bigger set, but, um, you know, the things I was able to do with the set of 12 were actually, yeah. it was, it was great. Like it, it actually gave me a really good sense of the product. And when I eventually I decided to buy more of them, it was because of even just using that small amount. Like, yeah. I think, you know, to, to limit yourself thinking, well, I have to, I have to buy the biggest set and I have to buy the, you know, the, you have to go to an extreme to, to really get the experience is not the case. Mm -hmm. It's, you're very, very um, easily able to, to be able to try certain things out and, and form an opinion of your own and, and then move on from it. You know, yeah. like if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but Right, right. I mean, I, I've actually really started to enjoy and kind of relish that experience of trying something new and trying a different combination. And nine times out of 10, I go back to the thing that I like, but right. I, I, I feel like I'm always willing and open to try something new because uh -huh. I think it's exciting when, you know, yeah. it's like Derwin, right? They came out with a whole light fast line. Right, people right. had just decided that polychromos, for example, was the best and that they never needed to try or use anything else they would have been closing themselves off to potentially a medium they liked more. Exactly. Not the case for everyone, exactly. but you know what I mean? Like yeah. these new innovations and new products and, and yeah. different things coming out, even, even when it's successful and even when it's not, it's exciting. It's exciting oh, it as is. an artist to be able to experience these things and, and, and try something new or, or add it to your, your cabinet of, of materials that yeah. you can potentially draw from. Yeah, exactly. And just increase the amount of things you can do. The, yeah. the uh, experimentation then is endless. And I, I think that's what keeps it new and interesting. Don't you, Barb? Where oh, totally. you don't have to stick with those tried and true materials that you may be getting great results with, but you can mix it up a little bit and you can start trying to incorporate some of the, the newer products as well. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm on a, I'm on this whole kick right now where I'm using acrylic gouache. Yeah, that's not colored mm, pencil at all, but right, right. I, I really enjoy using different mediums. And yeah. there may even be a point where I decide somehow to mix the two mediums together. Like, you know what I mean? Finding a way to well, do that. For me, that's part of yeah. the exploration and experimentation <laughs> yeah. as, right. as an artist. Yes, not like directly together, but you know what I'm saying? Like no, the same right, piece, right. finding love, a way. I love that idea, the whole you know, trying to figure out some mixed media. Um, yeah. Like I just think first. like, you know, even just, even just, just the experience, like part yeah. for me, the joy of being an artist is, is having the ability to try these different things and try different yeah. products and, 
and have these um, discoveries and explorations. And maybe that's not for you. And that's totally cool yeah. too. But I think, you know, for, for some people, it's like, you're really missing out if you don't give yourself a chance to, Absolutely. to kind of have those experiences and, yeah. and, and find something like you just, you might stumble upon something you really, really love. Yeah. And um, I think if you're, if you're kind of making up your mind ahead of time, based on somebody else's opinion or closing yourself off to an experience, yeah. then um, I think that's really unfortunate. And and that being said, I understand that sometimes there's a financial barrier to just being able right. to try things like that's totally fair. But again, that's where I would say, you know, look for sales, mm -hmm. buy the smaller version, yeah, do, do exactly. what you can, but but don't yeah. don't uh, rob yourself of that experience right. of, of trying other things. And I, and I love and I think that's a great takeaway and a, a good spot here to probably wrap up the show. Experiment for yourself and test all these other products. And, you know, for me, it's kind of an easier thing to do as well because there it appeals to that little stubborn streak that I have where if somebody says, no, that doesn't work or that that don't do that. I'm that I was that little boy. I just wanted to go do it. You know, uh, if, if mom said not to do something, I was over there doing it, you know, and uh, there is a little mischievous uh, streak in me. And I think it's coming back out because in, in art, that's the way I, I kind of roll. I mean, I, I, if I find that somebody's saying, Oh, don't use those products or something that has suddenly piqued my interest. And so that's something I'll, I'll gravitate towards and I'll try to make it work. Uh, even if uh, I hear that it can't. So I think it's been a great show, Barb. Any final takeaways? What do you think? Yeah, I think just keep keep experimenting. Keep yeah. trying to, you know, find new things. And, and I also just want to take a moment to send a little shout out to the monthly sharpener community. <laughs> I think everyone's really, really great over there. And I appreciate all your comments. And every time I'm on the show, I everyone's really great about leaving uh leaving a nice comment and I really enjoy oh. interacting with everyone over there. So I just want to <laughs> send a little, little shout out to the crew you know, <laughs> over there. That's they always are, commenting. <laughs> they are great. I mean, they, they really are. Yeah. So there's a link in the, the show notes guys, if you uh, want to check out the monthly sharpener group. Yeah, they really are great. Thanks Barb for saying that. I, yeah, I no, they're awesome. I just, I've been meaning, I've been meaning to say that before. I just, uh, I really, really enjoy the, uh, the group you have over there. I think uh, for anyone who's thinking of joining, it's a really great artist community and, and it's, it's really like, no, I, it sounds like you told me to say that, but I really, people thinking that I put you up to this or anything. No, was... you really didn't. I honestly, like I, <laughs> after we just talked about like sponsored place, <laughs> I'm, I'm literally getting no incentive from doing this other. I just, I guess my reason for mentioning it is just that I really, one of the things I've really come to appreciate in this whole lockdown situation that yeah. we're all in is, yeah. is a sense of having an artist community. And I feel like I, it is, it is hard enough sometimes to get people to engage with yeah. things and leave comments. And I just, I really value and appreciate when people take the time to do that, because I think, you know, it's easy enough to think something in your head and yeah. think, Oh, I really liked that. Or that was really great. But it really means a lot to people who are creating content and putting things out there when you actually leave that comment and say Absolutely. it out loud because it's yes. it's validating for what we're doing and it right. it, it it you know gives us a little fuzzy feeling inside. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can start to. I mean, I look at the stats once in a while and I I see the amount of downloads and it, it's it's huge, but there's still nothing like hearing from people through email and over there in monthly sharp yeah. hearing personal comments that I got to tell you that the culture over there is such, it's such a nice group. Uh, very, They're very just such nice people. people. Yes. People. Very I kind. Yeah. Really, really receptive, really open, like great yeah. dialogue over there. I just, right. I can't say enough about it. And I Incredible. thank you for Goes including me. <laughs> and I love that as well. Yeah. Critical thinking. All right. So totally. <laughs> we will wrap it up here. Uh, Bard, thanks so much for coming on again. I really appreciate it. And no guys, problem. again, like I've mentioned, check out the show notes, get your free sample of, uh, get your free sample pack of the UART premium pastel paper and uh, experiment. Let me know what you think. 
And all the show notes are available over there at sharpenedartist.com slash podcast. This is a weekly show, and I will talk to you again next week. And until then, stay sharp. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. All the show notes can be found at www.sharpenedartist.com.